From Eyewitness News, this is Newsmakers. Let's review the last four months in Rhode Island. Former House Speaker Gordon Fox's home and office raided by state and local authorities. A new leader in Nicholas Mattiello emerges in its wake. Vincent Buddy Cianci bursts back onto the political scene in yet another run for mayor. And the 38 Studios controversy continues to hang around like a bad house guest. Keeping with tradition, lawmakers work into the wee hours on a laundry list of legislation, including eliminating the master lever and the Sakana tolls, dropping corporate tax rates. Oh, and calamari is crowned the official appetizer of the state. In other words, a normal stretch around here. In the thick of it all, our guest this week on Newsmakers, Rhode Island's House Speaker, Nicholas Mattiello. Welcome to Newsmakers. I'm Tim White. Joining me on the panel, WPRI.com reporter Ted Nisi. Mr. Speaker, welcome back to the program. Oh, always a pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. Glad to hear that. You know, (laughs) as a matter of fact, the last time we had you on uh, was the beginning of the session. You had to ramp up very quickly uh, to get going after uh, all the hoopla that happened, to put it mildly. Uh, Now that's in the rearview mirror, your first session under your belt, what would you say is the one thing that you're most proud of from this session? I'm most proud of the budget. I'm most proud of the fact that post-March 25, when I was elected speaker, we had roughly 90 days, we passed a very bold, aggressive budget. We uh, we lowered the corporate tax rate from 9 to 7%. We raised the threshold on the estate tax to $1.5 million and, and uh, removed the cliff. It's a bold budget. It's going to help businesses, and it's going to help our job creators stay in Rhode Island. So I'm, I'm very pleased. We're going to get into the budget on this program. We actually have a lot of specifics to get into. But uh, before we get into all that, once again, the session went into the wee hours. Um, the, the lawmakers were considering bills 2, 3, 4 a.m. You know, we know that a lot of them don't get a chance to fully read them, fully vet them before they're actually voting for them. Is this how you think the legislative process should happen? Well, let me say this. On, we, we kept to our curfew uh, every night of the last week of session. Um, we had fully negotiated all our bills the, the, the evening before. There were only a few bills in play. All of the bills went through committee months earlier. The members were relatively familiar with all the bills. I certainly was familiar with all the bills. And it's a matter of negotiating with the Senate. The House prefers to pass some, the Senate prefers to pass some, and we decide which ones we both want to pass. Most of the business, even on the last night of session, was concluded by, I think, roughly 11 o'clock. Beyond that, it was just negotiating with the Senate on the Newport Grand Bill. So there was that one bill, and the terms of that were actually negotiated the night before. We were just looking at the terms, and we were looking at potential changes, and as it turned out, we went with the terms that were negotiated the, the night before with the Senate, and so there was really no change that evening. Most of the business, and I don't want to be fact-checked, but I think by 11 o'clock, 95 to 98 percent of the business was done. So we, we really didn't have that late-night session. We were just holding on one bill. Uh, so are you comfortable with that process? I mean, often maybe it was a little bit better, the session, and the perception was it, it went late, but as you say, you were considering one thing. But there's often that flurry of bills and sort of the last minute wheeling and dealing, that can't be easy on the rostrum for you either. Are you comfortable with that? Well, it's, it's, it's hard work. There's no question about it. I am comfortable with it because it's, it's realistically all I know. I've asked around <laughs> as to what other states do, and I believe every other state has a session that's very similar. Uh, that has a part-time legislature, you mean? Yes, and every legislature at the end really has the flurry of bills, and there's a reason for that. Everybody has a different priority, and it's like cramming for an exam. You, you cram at the end, everyone has different priorities. As you're working towards adjourning, all of the priorities come forth, and you have to deal with the, the, with the members' priorities. And we're all happy to do that, but as you're doing it, there's usually a flurry of bills, and, and there's always negotiation between the House and the Senate. In each chamber, we have to decide which bills we want to pass, which bills are priorities to us, and they may be different from the other chambers, so we have to work together. And as that negotiation occurs, we d- determine that we're going to pass X and Y of each other's bills. I want to go back to the budget. Um, 
uh, it's got your the budget has won a lot of praise. One uh, dissenting note we saw in the Providence Journal this week: Tom Goris, the liberal policy analyst, published a critique where he said, "quote." Economic development for years has meant only tax cuts for rich people and real estate development, and that's pretty much all we're getting again. Uh, how do you respond to that critique? Well, my response is the, the government should never pick winners and losers. What we try to do is create a good environment for everybody to, to succeed, to, to create economic growth. I believe that's what we did. You want to keep your job creators and, and your well-to-do folks in the state so that uh, they can... Uh, give to, to charity, uh, invest in companies, create jobs, and so forth. So I think if you create an environment that welcomes everybody to stay, then your economy is going to do better, and that's what we've tried to do with this with this particular budget. You also know that the budget, um, it's you're still facing large and growing deficits in the coming years, uh, more than a hundred million dollars next year, up to over four hundred million dollars by 2018 if the Massachusetts casinos come online, which now is a question. Uh, do you expect you'll have to raise taxes to reduce those deficits and get the budget back into balance? No, I'm not. I'm not looking to raise taxes in the future. My goal is to continue to create a better economic environment and atmosphere and to grow our economy. I think the way we work on reducing that structural deficit is to do things differently. And this budget was the first budget to do things differently, to move in a different direction, to create that better economic environment, better economic activity. I remember when I first became elected, my first term was in 2007, and our revenues were dropping like a rock. And that was through the loss of economic, ec economic activity due to the recession. Just as, as easily as we lost revenue, we can pick revenue up. We need a better economy. We, we need more small businesses. We need more large businesses. We need more middle class people working. And you know, when you get back to the, the question about winners and losers, the middle class person that has three kids to take care of, uh, even though he may not benefit from the estate tax, he or she, if he or she has a company that decided to come into Rhode Island or stay in Rhode Island or have a job created that stayed in Rhode Island, gave that person a job, that person and that family is going to be much better off. So that's the direction we're going to work in. More economic activity will create more revenues, will create more jobs, everybody will be better off. If, if, if economic growth, though, isn't enough to offset all that, it sounds like taxes are very low on your list of how to sign that. Are there parts of the budget where spending you think you'll have to look more closely at if it comes to that? We always have to be good stewards of, of tax Taxpayers' dollars, and we will look at that. The reality is, even though it's an eight plus billion dollar budget, a lot of the spending is fixed, and there's not a lot of areas to look at anymore. But we will always look at efficiencies and, and making cuts where appropriate. We have to provide essential services, and we'll continue to do that. And if you look at this last budget, it was very balanced. We took we took care of the business community, and we also took care of persons that rely upon. Uh, the government for their, their social service needs. How do you feel about Vincent Buddy Cianci running for mayor? I'm going to leave that to the, uh, the uh, taxpayers and the voters of the city in Providence. Uh, he has a right to run. He's a very interesting pe person. He's got a great personality. He's very gregarious. But uh, as far as uh, whether or not he should run, that's a personal decision that he should make. And the voters in the city of Providence are going to be a judge on whether or not it was the right decision. Yeah, but Speaker, you, you talk about wanting to make Rhode Island a, a business-friendly state. That's a priority for you, bring jobs in here. You know the headlines that are going to emerge out of this nationally if he wins mayor, that, uh, that Rhode Island voters elected a, a convicted felon back into office and the second time around was for uh, public corruption. Are you concerned about the message that will send to companies or businesses not only looking to move into Providence but into the entire state? Well, Tim, I'm going to leave that to you to analyze and to report on. What I will say is, yes, I'm always concerned about the image of the state. What I've said, and it, it goes to 38 studios and every other decision and issue that we look at, I am most concerned about the, issue, uh, the image of the state of Rhode Island. I want to have a good economic environment. I want companies to come in. I want the citizens to be, feel proud of this wonderful state that we, that we live in. So anything that could compromise that, I'm always concerned with, and I'm not going to be the judge of what's going to compromise it or whether or not Buddy Cianci's candidacy is going to compromise it. It sounds I like will, you don't want to be the judge in this case, to be honest with you. There are other items you might judge yes. regarding, but this one, why, why, are, you, that, why that's, are you being safe with it? That's fair to say. I, I'm just going to leave that decision to the voters of the city of Providence. You've run for office a couple of times. Do you think he can win? I think if, it, if I think he certainly can win. I'm not going to project him the winner. You don't want to be an analyst right now. <laughs> I'm not. I'm not an analyst, but he's he's a strong, viable candidate. I would suggest. Yeah. 
Fitch Ratings uh, announced last month that it now says it will not downgrade Rhode Island if the to junk status, even if the state refuses to pay the 38 Studios bonds. You just mentioned 38 Studios. Uh, that's contrary to a report commissioned earlier this year by the Chafee administration. Has that announcement from Fitch made you reconsider whether we should keep paying the bonds? You did support it this year? No, absolutely not. I, I was never of the opinion, and nobody ever said, the S&P and Moody's never said they would downgrade us to junk status. They said we would have a substantial multi-notch potential downgrade, but uh, certainly everybody agrees some downgrade would be in order. I, I believe we made the right decision to preserve the image of the state so that Rhode Island is not the second state in the union to ever default on an obligation. We maintained our willingness and uh, ability to maintain and pay our obligations. That's going to preserve our reputation, better our economic environment as, as we move forward. Rhode Island has to have the reputation that it keeps its obligations, whether it's relative to bonds or whether it's rel relative to business uh, businesses. When it makes a promise, it has to keep its promise. And as long as I'm speaker, that's going to be the case. Now, when you talk about 38 Studios, we also just had a settlement. And that settlement was predicated upon the fact that we appropriated the money. I'm expecting future settlements. There's a few, uh, at least two other defendants that I think will settle, I believe. I, I mean, I'm not going to promise that. I believe. But is that what you're hearing? I'm, I'm hearing that, and my, my, I'm an attorney. My, my personal uh, legal analysis of the situation suggests that that's a likely outcome. Who are the other outcome. two that might settle? I believe it's, uh, I believe Adler Pollock and Sheehan is a defendant, and Kurt Schilling. Kurt Schilling has a policy that's got five or six million left An insurance on it. policy for yes. liability. Yes. Um, so th those policies are in play. I'm not going to suggest what they're going to do, but I'm hoping that uh, we'll receive settlements from them also uh, shortly. And uh, there's Wells Fargo. They're, they're a defendant with very deep pockets. You don't need an insurance policy with Wells Fargo. And I believe that lawsuit will go to trial by the spring. So Rhode Island will have an outcome uh, uh, relative to the lawsuit. I'm hoping that we, we reclaim uh, most of the money, if not all of the money damages. And that would not have happened had we not appropriated the funds. We're uh, coming up against a break, but I want to stick with 38 Studios briefly here. Several weeks ago, you were contacted by the Colonel of the State Police. He wanted uh, information, contact information for members of the General Assembly so detectives could interview them if they had any other information to share regarding 38 Studios. The State Police have an active investigation there. Have you been interviewed yet by detectives? Yes, I have. And when was that? A uh, week and a half, two weeks ago. What did you tell them? I, I gave them background uh, relative to uh, my tenure in the General Assembly, what committees I've served on. I gave them background relative to the General Assembly, uh, the individuals in the General Assembly, uh, what I knew relative to 38 Studios, which was more or less after acquired information. And uh, I it was as cooperative as I could be. And uh, I, they thanked me for my, my cooperation. And, and uh, I told them, feel free to call me back if anything else comes up. Based on their line of questioning and what you shared, do you have an idea of where their investigation is headed? Well, they asked me about certain individuals, like which who? I'm not, I'm not going to mention. There's an ongoing investigation, so I'm certainly not going to mention that on a news uh, program. But they asked me about certain individuals, so I have some idea of where they're looking anyway. Uh, I don't know, I don't know uh, what they're looking at specifically, but I, I have an idea of where, who they're looking at or who they're asking questions about. Do you think you were helpful in terms of whatever the scope of their investigation was? Did you provide information that was worthy? You'd have to ask them if I was helpful. I provided as much background information as I could be to attempt to be helpful. And do you know of any, before we go to break, do you know of any other uh, lawmakers that have been interviewed by the state police? Yes, I, well, I, I know none specific are coming to mind, but several several lawmakers indicated to me that, uh, that they were contacted. Okay, we, uh, our guest this week on the program is House Speaker Nicholas Mattiello. Stay with us. You're watching Newsmakers.